Good afternoon. Welcome to another wonderful edition of Athena Protection Podcast. Yes, sir. Got myself, Carl, in the house today with my man, Dan. Yep. How's it going, man? It's going all right, man. Good, good. Out here in all this rain, but we made it here. Man, I thought I was going to have to bring my speedboat out today. Yeah. I saw some people, uh, I think it was in Dearborn, actually kayaking around the city oh, today. That's, that's, so. that's terrible. A lot of rain out there, a lot of rain. But it could be worse. They said if this mm-hmm. was snow, we'd get like three feet of snow today. Oh, yeah, they can keep that snow. I'm so, good with what we've been getting. I'll take this rain as long as my basement don't flood, knock right. on wood. Right, I don't, I don't want none of them issues. Right. But anyway, man, uh, so let's jump into it. Mm-hmm. Tell the people who we are and how they can get in touch with us. We are Athena Protection Service, and you can get in touch with us on any social media platform at Athena Protection Service. Or you can reach us on our website at athenaprotections.com or our phone number at 800-951-4866. And that's 1-800-951-4866. We provide security services. We provide private investigation services. And we provide concealed pistol license classes. So if you need a class, contact us and we'll take care of you. All right. And we can't forget our sponsor. And that would be Athena Protection Foundation. And that is always looking out for the crime victims. So anybody that is a crime victim in need of assistance, we can guide you in the right direction in getting you what you need. And you can reach our foundation at Athena Protection Foundation on any social media platform or athenaprotectionfnd.org. Awesome. So uh, aside from... uh, watching some sports today what's on your mind <laughs> oh man uh not a lot i got a uh, one thing i saw in the news i just wanted to kind of harp on right quick okay a guy was selling a cell phone to another guy online they meet up okay the guy take a look at the cell phone get it in his hand and then run oh man that, that <laughs> and happens. then when the guy went to chase him for his phone the thief pulled out a pistol on him oh man so and the guy is on all kinds of video in his red hoodie with his camouflage sleeves. So, uh, pointing the gun at the guy and everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. So, uh, if you're going to sell something to somebody online, you don't know the person, take somebody with you. That'll be my advice. Uh, okay. And if you know, if you got a CPL, take your weapon with you just in case uh, things get out of hand like this did. Wow. Um, but, I, you know, I wouldn't recommend chasing somebody for a phone. It, it is just a phone. You might want to let it go. Exactly. Of escalating the situation to a, a deadly force kind of situation. Exactly. So, you know, take somebody with you and, you know, try to mitigate uh, having to get into, you know, a shootout over a phone. Exactly. You know, don't, exactly. don't present the, the, the thief with an opportunity to take something from you. So. If you Something wanna. also, some of the uh, local uh, police stations actually have a Craigslist exchange mm-hmm. uh, right. location, usually right there in front of the police station or right. even inside of the police station. Right. So something they can also look into uh, because I just heard about a yeah. guy who was taking uh, people's uh, gym shoes or tennis shoes, depending on what yeah. part of the country you in. We, we call in them gym shoes in the Detroit. Detroit. We could say gym shoes so, in Detroit. Uh, my man, uh, <laughs> multiple people, he, you know, told him, yeah, I'll meet up and take those Jordans off your hand, the Yeezys or whatever they were. Right. And he took them off their hands, but he didn't want to <laughs> give them any money for it. And I think right. he also pulled the weapon. So, Oh, yeah. That police uh, station thing sounds good. Uh, so some you can do uh, if you're well, just really concerned, like you said. Uh, yeah. Don't put yourself in a situation where – you know, the item you're selling most definitely not worth somebody's life, I guess, when you look at the big scheme of it. Yeah. You know, we talk about it all the time in our classes that our goal is to help you be better prepared to defend yourself and others. And deadly force is always the last resort. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, in theory, if you're selling a pair of shoes or a phone, neither one of them over $1,000. So, right. shouldn't have to put somebody's life at risk for that but if it's gonna be somebody's yeah. don't let it be yours right so good point right that whole gym shoe thing remind me of when we went to new york right and, and i wanted some gym shoes and we was in the mall okay and i you know i'm like where y'all gym shoes at and she was like what i was like gym shoes you know 
uh, <laughs> which would wear the run in. She like, you talking about sneakers, yo? I'm like, yeah, them. <laughs> kind of like so, down south, they talk about yeah. soda. Uh, yeah. We, of course, here in the D, we say pop, but they yeah. say soda down south. And they say, what kind of soda you? No, actually, I was in Charlotte, and they just call everything Coke. <laughs> so you order a Coke, and they say, well, what kind you want? Then you say a Sprite or uh, oh, yeah. whatever. It's like, wow. That's weird. So, it was definitely funny. Yeah, that's strange. But anyway, man, what you got over there on the the thing you wanted to talk about? So, man, uh, I was looking at an article, and I'm going to pull it back up here in a second, but just talking about here in Michigan, the use of uh, text messaging while driving. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is literally a uh, representative, a state representative, fairly new. I think she's from Birmingham. I forget her name. Mm-hmm. But uh, she's in the process of pushing a bill that will actually, because uh, right now in the state of Michigan, driving a commercial vehicle, it's illegal for you to be on your mobile device, text messaging, uh, reading emails, uh, anything. You need to be hands-free. Right. So uh, just briefly looking at it, um, you know, the restriction on talking on the cell phone while driving is going to actually go into law. I know some of the cities, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Troy and a few other cities in the metro Detroit area, they've already kind of been, uh, mm-hmm. not kind of, they've actually uh, came out with that law in those cities where you just can't do it. And I mean, I'm telling you as a driver, man, I'm out mm-hmm. there, and for those of you listening, Next time you're out and about and you think there's a drunk driver in front of you or you want to think it's some little senior citizen that's just taking it real easy, I can tell you probably eight out of ten times when you get up next to that person and look over there, sure as shit, they either on the phone talking to somebody deep in conversation or they're in the middle of looking at their device. If they're not uh, trying to get the best shot on uh, Instagram, Mm -hmm. I won't just say the ladies, but I see a lot of ladies doing that. Uh, or they're trying to text message. And, you know, we've heard it a thousand times, thousands of times, let me rephrase that. But you just got to stop it, you know, mm-hmm. and it's unfortunate if it's going to take a law for that because to right. me that, you know, uh, not to go down a whole nother street on this topic, but it almost gives authorities another reason to pull you over mm-hmm. uh, for what, you might consider being profiled or something like that. Yeah. But basically, like I said, the law, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I kind of feel like it's needed, like I yeah. said, with the amount of concerns that I see out on the road. I'm out there all the time. I actually do a lot of driving for my uh, nine to five job. And being out there on the road, I see tons of people distracted mm-hmm. on their phones. And we all know the, the reports or right. the statistics as far as, you know, how far you travel in the three to four seconds. You might look down at your phone mm-hmm. at 50, 60 miles an hour. Yeah. Never mind the fact you're probably in an SUV or whatever vehicle. Running into someone could cause great damage. And then uh, never mind, though, you know, with the new law, uh, you're looking at fines and points on yeah. your drive record. And I want to say the fines, uh, Texan tickets will run the driver $100 for the first violation and 200 for the second or any other violations. And the cost can increase from what I'm seeing here. So most drivers' Texan violations wouldn't lead to, uh, you know, points. But for this, they're saying, you know, you can get points on your license just for driving in Texan. Come on now. We yeah. we in Michigan. If your mm-hmm. damn uh, car insurance ain't high enough, mm-hmm. don't put yourself in the situation to make it worse. Right. Driving in Texan. I feel you know, I feel like I get on my soapbox every week. Yeah. Um, That's all right. But you know, I uh I I myself have tried to text message while driving and I can't do it. <laughs> I, I can't do it uh, comfortably, I should say. Mm-hmm. Or, you know what, the text message is going to take me so long, I could have pulled over someplace and sent it to you because it's going to take me probably five or six miles to say, okay, I'm on the way. Right. Just because I'm going to type an O, look mm-hmm. up. I'm going to type a K, look up again. So, right. again, uh, it ain't worth it. You know, um, 
put the phones down. Now, some vehicles have uh, the capability of where you can get that text message or phone call and do it hands free, mm-hmm. uh, which is way better than actually taking your eyes off of the road. But even with that, you know, limit as much of that as possible because talking on the phone, uh, it's a distraction when you're driving. Even hands free, I feel like it's not right. as big of a difference from actually having the phone up to your hand talking mm-hmm. or up to your, I'm sorry, versus the hands free. Okay. I still feel like there's the opportunity for distraction, especially if you're having a conversation that could be, you know, that pulls mm-hmm. up some type of emotions. Right. You arguing with somebody or overly okay, excited, whatever it is, right. you know. But I most definitely, in my opinion, being out on the road as much, man, I see a lot of people in heated conversations. All right. All right. So. Yeah. We're not um, online. Yeah, it's not popping up. All right, we good now. Okay, sorry about that. I'll have right. clip audio too. Okay, all right. So we need to start over. I don't. Pick up where you left off at. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sorry for those little technical difficulties yeah. there. We're we're back online. Yeah. Uh, thanks to our awesome staff here, our engineer at yeah. uh, Podcast Detroit. That's mm-hmm. why we come here and deal with them. Uh, right. They take care of us here. Yes, they do. So uh, what was you getting ready to talk about, Dan? Man, I was going to talk about us being products of our environment. Okay. You know, and, and it's criminal it's activity because of where you come from. And I think it's a mixture of things, you know what I mean? So you say, make sure I'm understanding you right, you say yeah. uh, being a product of your environment yes. and being involved with criminal activity. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to talk about myself, right? So I'm going to take you That's back That's always to, a good good place to start. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to take you back to like 1984, 85-ish, 84, 85, somewhere okay. around there. You know, I committed my first criminal act. Okay. Right? So Has the statute of limitations ran out on this? It's ran out on this. This okay. was a, this was a petty crime sure. that I committed. Okay. That was about four or five years old, right? So Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> Hopefully so, you weren't committing felonies. So, you know, we go up to Thrifty Scott, for those of you that know it, uh, Dexter and Joy Road. You oh, know, yeah, the, that used to be the spot back in the The 80s. Borgans of Detroit. So okay. we go to the little store, and I asked my sister for some money because I wanted this pack of Bubblicious. And, they had uh, it right I high for it was four right there, old, you know, right was, at the register. It was right in my face. I had to go. So... She like, no, I ain't got nothing extra. I don't know who sent this off Carter to go get it. Okay. So, but I, I'm like, you know, I'm I'm not leaving out of here without this bubblicious. You know what wow. I mean? Like, I I need this. Okay. So I had to have it. So I hit the, I hit the shelf, and I take the bubblicious, put it in my pocket. We bought, we walked back to Carter. Just one pack. You just didn't get I only, for I only got, else? I only got one pack. See, I, at least you. I was new at this, so okay. you know, I wasn't all the way in. So. We get back on the block, and I'm chewing like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm, saying? I'm popping bubbles. <laughs> you blowing bubbles the whole night, right? And, and my sister go, where the hell you get that gun from? <laughs> now, instead of doing the right thing and being like, you in trouble, you shouldn't have took it, she like, if you don't give me none, I'm telling her. Okay, wow. So, <laughs> basically... Sound I got like something she would have said too. <laughs> it was like some kind of extortion because you know she checked my pockets and took more than one piece. So I thought I had enough for a couple of days. 
but it ended up I ended up with one other piece out the pack, and the rest was spread amongst the others that was there because you know we ran we ran in numbers. Okay. So I end up with basically nothing out the pack, but two pieces of gum, and the rest end up going all the other. Well, kids. you had the pieces you were chewing on. Yeah, that one piece, and I had another piece for okay. later. That was all I had. Okay. So that made me feel like crime don't pay, right there. Wow. So, That's- but. That's most definitely an awesome, uh, what they call that, epiphany? Yeah. <laughs> so it was that, and I was thinking about, like, how coming up I was surrounded by drug dealers and the money and, okay. you know, the bags of money was all around. And exactly. And we would spend the summer in a crack house, which was a relative's house, and right. none of this was wrong to me, right? So this this just how we get down, you know, this is what we do. Exactly. You know, I count rocks when he need to play counting and. I count money when he need money counted, and I stir the crack in the pot and all this shit that I should never be doing or knowing how to do. Exactly. But that never intrigued me. So it was probably initially going, like, to my father's office. Like, he had an office space on, I remember on that. Greenfield and Nine, Nine Mile. Mile. So he Across had this the office. Vans building. Yeah. And his name was on the desk, and he was telling this other dude what to do. You know, and I'm like, that looked like something... I want to be involved in, you know what I'm saying? And right. I was always intrigued by that corporate life, more so than the, the criminal life. But thinking about it, I, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody, and when you don't have anything, you are likely to resort to crime when there's nothing, like when you have no other options. So I feel like people are susceptible to that. So when... You there's no jobs really available, you know, minimum wage like nine dollars. So who can live off that? You know, exactly. and you wanna make ends meet. Is drugs out there available for you to sell? You know what I'm saying? Or it's other acts that you can commit to get money. And then exactly. you, can, you know, you can live off that better than struggling at a job. So is it my question was like, is it the environment? Is it family? You know, but for me, like, I was never encouraged to do anything. You know what I mean? Like, anything I ever did was on my own. Okay. Nobody ever suggested, you know, that I do things. It was all, right. you know, me thinking I needed something extra. And if I could just interject on that, because when I think back, when you said, you know, 84, 85, uh, we know uh, here in, in the metro Detroit area, that's when the crack uh, really hit this area hard. And, uh, you know, you being the age that you were, when I fast forward and think back to that and think of the age that I was, which was, you know, a little bit older than you are, uh, and the experience I had with that was totally different because Mm -hmm. I was at an age where, you know, you wanted to have the nice things. uh, You almost felt like you kind of had to have them because, you know, I was heavy into dating back then, you know, chasing, chasing young women and, trying to, you know, be fly in school and not look bummy, you know, and here it is because this, you know, started out as a very, you know, wealthy thing for people who weren't used to having things, uh, again, being illegal, unfortunately, but right. people were able to make a lot of money mm-hmm. fast and change their environment or not even change the environment because the environment really got destroyed and we look back at it. That's another mm-hmm. podcast, another day. Right. But back to my original point. Sorry, I was kind of getting off base there. That's okay. We, uh, you know, we were experiencing this epidemic and seeing uh, the the financial mm-hmm. come-ups, as we like to say in the neighborhood, right. you know, I seen it differently. You know, unfortunately at that time I wasn't seeing any of the people who I already was looking up to um doing as much as what mm-hmm. your dad was doing. Right. I went to that office yeah. and I seen that. But at my age, I was like, well, I, I need a Benz or a BMW. <laughs> but actually, back then, I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't even a Benz or a BMW. I ain't going to yeah. even front. You know what it was back then? And, wow. and I, I think uh, uh, one of the rappers made a song about it. Man, mm-hmm. I wanted a Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> That's SUV yeah, for those you yeah. don't know what I'm talking about. I, and I, I wanted to put some 16s on it. Yeah, I was gonna keep them clean, and I just needed a <laughs> kicker in the back, and I was good, you know. So, uh, most definitely was 
due to the environment that I was in mm -hmm. and at the level or the age that I was at at the time, right. it was a lot harder, I feel like, for me to turn away from that and look right. at it. You know, for me, to, the, the epiphany or the life-changing moment is after a couple of shootouts, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, hey, you know, this, this ain't cool. You know, yeah, one yeah. of the guys that uh, was with me one time actually uh, – Picked his hat up and it had a bullet hole through it, <laughs> and he thought it just yeah. fell off. It got yeah. shot off his head. So, damn, you know, uh, yeah. for me being in multiple situations like that, I mm -hmm. said it's time for a change. Right. And ironically, when we talk about our family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and for those out there in uh, listening land, uh, if you didn't know, Dan and I are cousins, first mm -hmm. cousins, you know. Uh, his dad is my my uncle. Um, they come from a family of 15 brothers and sisters. Right. And I can honestly say when I look back on it, as we talk about being a victim of the environment, uh, never has any of my uncles uh, been to prison. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, none of my aunties, uh, same thing. So for you, it was seeing your dad in that office building. Right. Like I say, for me, that that didn't do nothing for right. me. It was when I uh, actually was watching an all-star game and seeing the city of Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And at the time, one of our aunties was living there. Yeah. And they showed the skyline as they do on my scene. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a beautiful city. I just pictured it being people riding horses. Didn't mm -hmm. really have a lot of shoes down there, no concrete roads. Right. You no, know, a lot of fishing at the... The pine and you know i didn't know charlotte was an up-and-coming city as it was and this mm -hmm. was in the early 90s for me so right. fast forward about eight years from what you were talking about six to seven eight years uh going down there is what changed it for me and mm -hmm. said hey it's a different way uh okay. but most definitely had to take myself out of that environment completely in order for so, me to feel like i feel like a that change too. Because I think I was probably my most reckless in my teen years. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Listening to Mac Maw, uh, you know, riding in my little Cutlass Sierra. Oh, wow. You know, and doing my little hustle, my little side hustles I had going on. But I had a job, too. And, you know, exactly. I was always going to school. And uh, I just felt like, you know, just being around everybody and, you know, just – spontaneous things would happen, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I don't know what it was about me, but, like, you know, people felt like they could check me for some reason. Okay. So I don't know why. I don't know. So <laughs> one day, like, we was at the liquor store, and uh, i never forget it. You know, I'm just standing there, you know, minding my business, and a guy take his 40 and just slam it in the window in front of me, and I was next. And he looked at me, and he said, yeah, I'm next little nigga. Wow. And I looked at him, and uh, I'm with like four or five people, you know, and my man like, please don't tear my stove up. And I'm like, you know, we ain't going to tear your stove up. You know, we let my man go about his business. And then we go outside. We get what we get. We go outside. We happen to turn a corner. Lo and behold, there he was. Wow. Weave, jump out the car. And just get the punching on him. Okay. And then I jump out the car. I was driving and jumped out the car and didn't park it or nothing. My car started rolling up wow. the street so I could get on this guy. And then I don't know who stopped the car. Somebody went and got the car. Okay. So we get them together, get back in the car. We've got my man's shoes with him. Oh, wow. I'm like, why you take his shoes? He like, oh, you know, I thought these were my shoes. Then he jumped back out the car. And go get my man some more, get his shoes, and then come back. Okay. Just that's just like a regular occurring thing that, that would happen with us. Like you. just people would just try us. You know what I'm saying? Or or, or try me. Okay. And, and we was always it felt like it was always like negative energy around us. You know what I'm saying? Like whenever we went somewhere, people would tell us, you know, we had negative energy around us. And I felt like, you know, I needed to get away from that. So I think I ended up, you know, at the time I ended up uh, just separating myself and kind of doing my own thing. And I think that was what kind of helped me, you know, to get on the right path. 
Exactly. But uh, for those people who typically in those situations uh, don't have the opportunity, you know, I was very fortunate at the age that I was to be able to pick up and go again. We come from a big family, and mm -hmm. uh, even now we have uh, parts of our you know, immediate family that are spread out throughout the country. I know we've got uh, aunties down south and, you know, uncles that have been in other states and whatnot. So for us, we were fortunate enough that we're, we could get opportunity to, you know, remove ourselves from that environment. But, mm -hmm. you know, back to your original uh, question or, right. or statement, you know, being the victim of your environment when it comes to the criminal aspect, you know, how do you separate yourself from those type of situations for someone who wasn't as fortunate as both of us because for us mm -hmm. to be sitting here today right. you know surviving those mid 80s and even right. the early 90s mm -hmm. um, just looking back on it like wow I don't I oh, see that's what I'm stuck at because okay. I, I feel like I, you know I, I, I'm blessed to have both of my parents you know they wasn't together, you know, and obviously, and uh, they, um, you know, to give me the proper advice I felt like I needed okay. at, at times. So, you know, like when we got carjacked in 99, I, I wanted to go kill those guys, you know, and if I found them, that was the objective right. because I felt disrespected, you know what I'm saying? I felt like my pride was hurt, you know, and you don't want anybody to ever take advantage of you and you know, you want to get your get back on them. Exactly. So, you know, whatever you can you can get on them, if you can, you know, bring them some kind of hardship and pain, you all about that. Right. So, but, you know, listening to my mother and, you know, her telling me, you know, let God handle it. And, you know, I'm like, well, all right, you know, God got 24 hours. Okay. And then <laughs> the crazy thing is they called. The police called the next day and had the guys in custody like that next morning. Wow. So I was like, okay, you know, I guess I'm going to go on the bro with you and listen to you a little bit. Right. That's so, so deep. Yeah. But hold that thought, man, because we're about halfway through the podcast. Yeah. And uh, just in case there's anybody just joining us, uh, tell them how they can get in touch with us. They Dan. can get in touch with us on any social media platform at Athena Protections, Athena Protection Service. And you can reach us on our website at athenaprotections.com. Or you can reach us on our 1-800 number at 800-951-4866. It's 1-800-951-4866. Give us a call if you need security services, CPL class, or private investigation work. Awesome. And uh, again, let's uh, give a shout out to our uh, sponsor today. Our sponsor is Athena Protection Foundation. And you can reach us on all social media platforms at Athena Protection Foundation. Okay, awesome. So as you were saying, uh, your mom said, "Get, get, put yeah, it, in, put yeah, it in God's hands." And put it in God's hands, you, and I you told said her, "You give him twenty-four hours. God get got, him twenty-four yeah, hours." Yeah, he Sorry. had twenty-four hours. He delivered in like twelve. Wow. So I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna roll with you." So that's how I ended up being in that situation. As much as I despised that situation, that's what led me to the police department because okay. I was with the carjacking unit and. The dude named Dion Peoples, I, I reached out to him and told him what he meant to me because he didn't know how significant that interaction was between us that made me make that decision. But he was making a lot of money to me, which was a lot of money, you know, okay. working. So, you know, he was getting good money, and he was telling me how they had good benefits, and I was working at Home Depot, and my insurance wasn't that good. And I remember I, I had just had an insurance bill because I had sprained my wrist at the boxing gym. And I okay. went to the doctor, and I had this bill, and he was I was telling him about it, and he was like, oh, we don't pay for none of that. So, you know, he was just gaming me up on how much they get at the police department. So wow. I was like, shit, uh, you know, I might want to go do this, you know. So exactly, I ended up, you know, going to do that. It took uh, probably a year or so for me to get on, but that's when I kind of made the decision I was going to leave all my little hustling alone and, and I was going to join the police department. I had to get some stuff away when I got hired, but it's all good. I, I understand. Ain't, I, don't, I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> understand. <laughs> that. Wow. But yeah, that's uh. I think that was kind of the moment where I was like, I'm straightening my life out a little bit because I always felt like I was always trying to do something to get ahead or to kind of 
you know, keep some extra money in my pocket. And, you know, I, I felt like, you know, I wasn't 100 percent committed to doing the right thing. But I think it's a in some cases it's an individual thing. But for people that don't have, you know, that support or they're not groomed to do the right thing, they I think they may lean more you know, towards doing, you know, different things to survive. Right. Like you said, for you, seeing, seeing, your, seeing your father uh, at office with his name on the desk and, mm-hmm. and calling the shots, Right. Uh, that was an awesome thing, you know. So I most definitely could see how at that age that would be very impressionable on you and uh, which was driven you to this day to be, the man you become and, and will be as you continue on your journey to being uh, successful. Right. Uh, because, like I said, being a little bit older at the time, you know, because of that environment, like I talked about earlier, for me, and it's funny you brought up Home Depot because mm-hmm. Home Depot changed my life as well, as, yeah. as you know. And a uh, company that gave me opportunity to go from you know, what was called a lot engineer all the way up to general manager of the whole store. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what in reality wasn't a lot of time. You know, it took me mm-hmm. about uh, four years with the company, three and a half, four years to go from um, basically shagging carts in the parking lot to being a general mm-hmm. manager. And that's because I worked hard and I had that attitude. If I could sell dope, I could sell anything. Right. You know, I felt like it was the same concept, mm-hmm. uh, just without the violence. Right. You know, and the violence, you know, and we'll kind of come back to it, but, you know, just saying that, you know, people will buy stuff from you if you know how to sell it. Mm-hmm. Because the product sells itself. We all know that. Right. Uh, but it's the person that's selling it. The person that's buying it, do they like you? Right. It's just that simple. Mm-hmm. You know, and... Uh, I think that was really an eye opener for me, learning how to professionally sell things. Which you know, now I'm 25, almost 30 years uh, into the game of selling stuff right. um, legally, <laughs> uh, it <laughs> continues to you know support right. me and my family. Right. But you know, back to as I said, to come back around, just mm-hmm. the environment that you're in when when you don't have you know positive uh, opportunities right there on a day-to-day, how do you get out of it? Because right. the, the percentage of people that make it through mm-hmm. compared to the ones who get caught into the system right. and things of that nature, it's, it's a big discrepancy. You know, yeah. A very small percentage, I'd say maybe 10% or less, get the opportunity that we had. Uh, but um, without getting too deep into it, I've heard this quite a bit lately, but it's, you know, was you raised on love? Or was you just raised on survival? Mm-hmm. Because we were surviving, but we was most definitely, you know, raised on love. Right. I can say just looking at us as a whole coming from, as I say, my mother and your brother, you know, sisters, brother mm-hmm. and sister, mm-hmm. you know, coming from 15 siblings, a lot of love in the house. Didn't have a lot of things, but a lot of love in the house. And, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you look at those environments, even some of our friends growing up, that wasn't necessarily the case. Right. So the way you move and even the way you, you know, view people ends up being different, I think, when you're in survival mode. So it most definitely could be uh, something that you have to say, how do we get past that survival mode situation to so many people in, in those mm-hmm. environments where things are being done illegally? Right. How do you get past that? Yeah. Shit, man, I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, think as when I went to the police department, it made me, I think, more lenient towards people I saw in the street, you know, kind of doing what, whatever they felt like they needed to do to survive. Right. Like, I necessarily, I don't want to lock you up. You know, I gave a lot of passes. I felt like it was my obligation to give a pass. You know what I'm saying? Because you understand the environment yeah. you come from. I, I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it for the most part. You know, I, you know, I feel like we have a commonality there. So, you know, I'm going to give you a pass. I'm going to let you leave. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, but don't come back. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how I would approach, you know, the people in the street. 
you know. Yeah, it's kind of like a baby cussing. Yeah, you, know, you, you know. can't be mad at the baby because it cussing. Right. You gotta look the people baby around. Cause right. I'm a, he I'm just a, learned how to talk. Yeah, I'm gonna try to guide you in the right direction if I can, and you know, and you know, I'm not always out there to lock everybody up or you know, you know, take you know everybody to jail, you know, and, and put them in a situation where they can't move in the future. Because, they, you know, they got a record. I always consider those things. Okay. You know, because I had a, you know, my record was clear. And you you lose a lot once you get in the system. And I'm I'm not eager to put people in the system. I never was. Exactly. So. You know, it's almost like we're going to start having to use the bell up in here. I just had another epiphany. Uh-huh. Uh, so we talk about trying to, you know, change that stigma of, you know, you are a product of your environment. You know, for us, if you're not a good athlete or uh, fortunate enough to be a really good student and get a scholarship and go off to college, you end mm-hmm. up just being in the hood, repeating the cycle right. uh, generation from generation. Uh, in this day and age, there is a, a opportunity socially with, with the ability to get information off a of smart device and things for you to really – you know, find your lane. Mm-hmm. For you, it was a, a, a couple of events that kind of happened one after another and just hearing your story and knowing your story that those things were able to help you go down the path you own. But for that young person that's, you know, out here listening and you're in that environment, you know, know that I don't, I don't like to get too into the politics of it, but know that the system was set up for you to fail. Mm-hmm. And instead of just accepting that, prove the system wrong and say, fuck that, I'm not going to let you make me fail. Right. You know, that was kind of my attitude. It's like, don't stereotype me and put me into a box where because I come from this bad neighborhood, because uh, I have people around me that are doing criminal activities and like we said we we kind of understand it just from growing Mm -hmm. up in it but just having that attitude that i will not let you put me in a box and say that this is all i'll be but that take a lot of strength prove prove the naysayer is wrong it takes a lot of strength but i just got a lot of faith in our young people today Mm -hmm. that uh we can communicate that to them and understand you know and it's the same thing for us understand that you got to find who you want to be and are going to be. I think mm-hmm. too many times in in our society, and this is across the board, we see things, talking back to that, that, that smart device, mm-hmm. we see things on social media that we deem to be true, and we want to follow those, or on the TV. Mm-hmm. And in reality, those aren't the truth. You know, it's, it's fewer than, than most that are living like, the Kardashians or, right. you know, some of these other uh, internet or or reality TV celebrities. You have to ask yourself when you're watching these shows and you're so in-depth into them and mm-hmm. you think, wow, this great day living. Uh, our uh, media society has just flipped the script on you. Don't, don't let it uh, fool you. They've taken and they call it reality TV, meaning it's real. It's the same old thing as it was when we was watching Good Times and the Jeffersons. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just made for TV. Right. And a lot of what people are trying to emulate right now is based off of what they see on social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those young people out there that are in those environments, again, I just think you got to really know that a lot of mm-hmm. what you see, whether it's the people thugging or, or whatnot right. or trying to represent a certain... Uh, image is all just for show yeah i mean we definitely didn't have the internet influence but we had neighborhood influences we had people getting rich off drugs and we had rap city we had you know on tv raps you know we looking up to these figures just like people look up to who they look up to today and, you know, they want those things. And, you know, then we go after those things. Like, you wanted that Jimmy. Like, people want a Benz now. Or, you know, they want Yeezys and they want the vacation, you know, everything. And- you know, they want YSL and 
all the name brand things that they can get their hands on. Exactly. But, but that's not really what it's all about. And it's hard to, you know, how do you get people to understand that, especially in those teenage years when they're so impressionable? Exactly. Like with us, we grew up, at least I grew up in an era where, you know, it was everybody had to be tough. And it was impressionable to be tough. And you had to, you know, fight all the time. And, you know, you, you had to, you know, do whatever everybody else was doing. Exactly. It, you know, how do you get people to, how do you get to a space where you make your own decisions and be that individual that you need to be and not be a part of the masses that's doing the group thing? You know what I'm saying? Right. So. And that's why I kind of go back to the, I talk about the social media because it does give you the opportunity to, you know, you can you can follow what everybody else is following, but now you have the ability to be able to interact and do things totally different from the environment that you in. Rather is, you know, I, I seen a young a young black girl is uh, getting ready to be in a partnership with Barbie because she was creating mm-hmm. clothes for her little Barbie dolls, and okay. Barbie said, "Hey, or uh, what is it, Mattel? I'm sorry, the, mm-hmm. the manufacturer said, uh, hey, you know, we like what you're doing. I think we can make money off of this." No, this is a little kid. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I mean, and I could go on and on about the different stories. So, again, taking advantage of this social media in a positive way. Now, you don't have to have a whole bunch of money to be able to set up a YouTube page now because you got Mm -hmm. a smartphone and being able to talk about whatever is on your mind, whether it's something that's, you know, wrong or right. But having a platform where you can share that, you'll be amazed at how many people Mm -hmm. will follow and be inspired by your story. I had a quick, quick, quick story. I had a conversation with my son, and he went to a communications camp mm-hmm. for school. And my son plays a, a few different sports, but he said he was so shocked at how many people at this camp, because this was just a variety of kids from his high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't know a lot of them personally, but the reason I brought up him being in the sports is because obviously with sports, people know who you are. Right. You know, you might not necessarily know them specifically, but when you're on a basketball, football, or something like that in high school, people know you from being on there. Mm-hmm. And just he was overwhelmed by how many of the kids there, and one in particular telling him that, hey, you really inspire me because I've spoke to you on multiple occasions just throughout the hallway, and you've always acknowledged me or, mm-hmm. you know, when I, you know, have interacted with you, you've always had a positive attitude. Right. And that meant a lot to me. My son couldn't think of not one thing that he said or did right, right. That, the, that this kid was talking about. And I say, it's just your personality. Mm-hmm. And that goes a long way. So I say that to say that, you know, you have these influences on people. Mm-hmm. Uh, use, all I'm saying is just use this social media platform that so many of us have, mm-hmm. i.e. ourselves today. Right. And, and just, you know, think of ways that you can go out there, whatever your lane is, and, and, and do something, but most definitely not being a victim of that environment just mm-hmm. because you're in that hood. Right. You know, that little girl uh, that's selling the Barbie. Uh, you know, for us, you know, we had to try a lemonade stand or something crazy like that. Mm-hmm. After you or a paper for me, it was a paper route. Right. You know, I had my paper route and I went out and got all my money and collected. And sure enough, some guy waiting was trying to rob us as soon as we had yeah. collected what he figured would be a good about twenty dollars. He's like, "That'll be a come up." I got my ass whooped trying to go on the paper route with the <laughs> twins on my block. So I thought, <laughs> I thought a block was Main Street, the Main Street. So I thought Dexter the Grand River was a block. Okay. So I found out the hard way yeah, that that's that's that's, 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 quite that's a few blocks. yeah that's that's not it that's not the way. So um, I went on the paper route with them, and uh, we get to the lick the you know the little corner store on Grand River, um, and you know they buy you know can- chips, candy, you know things that kids buy, okay. and one two liter of pop. Now I don't drink. Anybody know me? I don't drink out to anybody. And okay. they were drinking out of this two liter, and it was Cheetos floating in it. Oh, and man. Everything that, everything that they was eating was floating in it. Uh, so I'm like, no, I'm going to take my little candy and go. Okay. So, you know, I go back home. You know, I go in the door. I'm all happy. You know, I got my, I think I had some Twizzlers or something. I step in the door, man, and my mama had that belt. Wow. Now, anybody know my mama know that she had this brown belt 
with these metal holes in it mm. for the belt loops. And every kid's name in the family was on this belt. Wow. So they, they had been taken down by it? Yes. So she whooped the shit out of me that day for leaving off the block. And that's how I found out what a block was. I know that was way <laughs> off topic, but <laughs> actually it wasn't because you know, we, we talk about the environment we grow up in yeah. and, and even, you know, we were talking about the criminal aspect of it, which now which it just still blows my mind. Mm-hmm. It's it's against the law to, you know, use physical force towards kids. Yeah, you know, that, when we grew up in it, an environment where like there wasn't the no age. such such law. My mama got me together. I mean, you <laughs> you beat on kids, and, and it's <laughs> it's crazy because when I look at it now, because every now and then you see a parent that's trying to be what we like to call old school, mm-hmm. and you see it, and you just look at it so differently now because we've been programmed, and I won't even say programmed, we've been educated to understand right. that it's a better way to right. discipline because right. you know every kid doesn't come out of that. Saying, you know what, I'm gonna act right. Mm-hmm. You know what ends up happening is when they can't figure out another way to solve a problem, they resort to violence. Right, and that's a big part of that environment too. Is the amount of violence that is is uh, the norm, and I think it starts when you're young like that. Yeah, I you had know. a, you know, my cousin Billy was like that. Absolutely. He was all about some violence, and the whooping wasn't gonna stop him from being bad. Like he right. would he would take that L from his mama or his daddy and going back to doing what he was doing. Cause he the person, he the reason I had my first drink. So my mama sent me over their house. Okay. And this was I was probably ninety one. You know, she sent me over there, you know, for the weekend. It's just him. I think his uncle Keith was there and his brother was there. And you know they like man, you know you know your mama sent you with some money. They know I always had a little bit of money on me. Okay. You know they like let's go to the store get some beers. You know I don't drink beer, but I'll buy y'all some. You know what I'm saying? Such a nice man. You know Still that's how bring I the am. Brew that's how I am. Day. You know I bring the brew. So we go to the liquor store. You know his uncle get the beers, and we all get back to the house. You know they cracking beers, drinking, and he like man, you gonna drink your brew? I'm like oh no, I don't, you know, I'm 12. I don't drink beer. You know, so right. he like, uh, let me tell you how this gonna go. He cracked the brew and held it over my head. Okay. And he said, You got two options. You could drink it or wear it. Wow. So, you know, I ain't want no smoke with him. We had already had plenty of fights before. Okay. And I'm like, I ain't you know, I just wasn't in the mood to go down that road that day. Right. So I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go on to drink that. So <laughs> I Interesting. Had first, That's your first drink. Yeah. It was a 40 of, like, Ice House or something cheap, too. Okay. It was terrible. <laughs> you drank the whole 40? I don't even remember if I drank the whole 40, right. but it was awful. Fast forward, uh, I actually yeah. had my first drink <laughs> messing with your father. <laughs> but in his defense, yeah. he didn't offer it to me. Yeah. You remember he used to throw those picnics mm-hmm. or the uh, cookouts, I should say. I don't yeah. use the word picnic anymore. We'll talk about that on another topic, yeah. another podcast. But uh, we had a cookout, a celebration, actually, for mm-hmm. one of his businesses. Okay. And uh, I went and shot basketball all day while we was at the park and got back, and all of y'all kids had drank all of the pop the club sodas y'all drank <laughs> every one of them it was it wasn't anything in the cooler yeah. except for beer and i had yeah. been playing basketball for what felt like 20 hours but it was probably a good three to four hours right and looked in the cooler and the only thing that was in there cold was uh cans mm-hmm. of beer so i grabbed yeah. about three of them and went behind a tree and i hurry <laughs> up and drank them fast and on yeah. the way home i was like man i feel wonderful <laughs> And that was just a thing after that. I started man. drinking drinking oh, okay. beer after I played basketball. Man, so I man. played a lot of ball and drank a lot of beer as a teenager. And that is a strange combination. It's kind of how I got started. But, you know, okay. again, you know, we, you know, so, you know, to get back on the topic as we get ready to wrap up today, right. uh, just, you know, you, you know, we could talk about it all day, but just mm-hmm. talking about that environment yeah. that you grow up in, you know, we can kind of look back on it and laugh uh, mm-hmm. about some of the things we went through, but we most definitely, uh, for the both of us, and we had the opportunity to turn those negatives into positives. We did, that. And And I know for a fact that my goal when I talk to my younger uh, relatives and just young people in general, I'm trying to 
tell them don't take the the long path that I feel like it took for me. Mm-hmm. You know, take advantage of being in 2020 and how fast you can get a positive message. The same right. way you can get a negative one out there, you can get right. a positive one out there. And there's so many things you can do now on a come up. You know, for us, coming up, we didn't feel like we had a lot of choices mm-hmm. to be successful. We had to fall into right. a very few uh, categories as far as uh, opportunities to to do things, you know, aside from, you know, being an athlete or, you know, we, we just was happy, if be honest with you, we just happy if we can get in one of the big three. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the come up for us, right. you know, work work 60 hours a week because you got to get that OT and, mm-hmm. yeah, you make good money, but yeah. you work 60 hours a week. 60 hours a week, <laughs> you know. To this day, yeah. I got friends and family that right. work in the factories. You don't see them. Yeah. You know, you do see them. They talking about all of the money they making, but, mm-hmm. man, they work a lot of hours. Mm-hmm. So I won't not knock them, but just saying that that wasn't right. necessarily a, a lot of opportunities coming up as we do now. Right. You know, we have people making money off of, having a YouTube page with mm-hmm. a lot of followers and picking up sponsors. Yeah. You know, there's uh, kids that are on YouTube playing with toys and, and getting paid. Yeah. There are people, young ladies, uh, doing makeup tutorials and getting paid. Mm-hmm. You know, there's young men who are, you know, aside from getting into the music industry and, like I said, sports and things of that nature, that are – taking advantage of being funny Mm -hmm. and making YouTube pages and, you know, taking it to that next level. I just think of a few people back when they had, what was was it, Divine? Mm -hmm. Uh, That now I see them on major TV shows, uh, you know, shout out to Nick Cannon with his Mm -hmm. Wildin' Out, Mm -hmm. uh, which I heard he's going to be coming here to the Metro Detroit area uh, for anybody interested in those type of things. But, yeah, man, just to wrap up, as I was saying, I really feel like in this era, we have that opportunity to Mm -hmm. do something differently than being a victim of that environment that you grow up in. Right. Uh, Because we always talk about the negative that the social media and and these smart devices do, the positive, you know, whatever it is, you know, take your iPhone, you can create videos, you know. Yeah. It's real easy to get, at least back then, it was easy to get sucked into it and you know, feel like you had to do you a little hustle and do things so you can make some money. But there's a lot of avenues out there. But I think we got to be consistent in making sure. And it's hard because people got to, you know, younger, at least the younger kids got to learn and live. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't want them to do what we did or go through some of those hardships that we went through. But, you know, they have to learn and grow on their own. And they have to have those experiences and that hardship in order to grow. I and agree. I understood that, you know, a lot of my hardships were some kind of blessing came after the fact. So, right. you know, I just have to, you know, keep that in mind. And as they learn and you don't want to see them go through nothing. But when they do, hopefully they learn from it and, you know, they come out better on the other side of it. Absolutely. So, you know, great point. Uh, great topic. Uh, we both. Uh, can talk from our experiences that we uh, had growing up. And like you said, uh, in this day and age, uh, we feel like it's different or it might not be different because they feel that way as teenagers and young people or just in mm-hmm. general in those environments. Um, we have much more opportunity to get out, out of them faster than we did before. Right, But the biggest point is getting people to understand when you are dealing with people in those environments, dig a little deeper. Right. You know, if the last thing I'll say closing out is when someone does something to you before you just react to exactly what was done, mm-hmm. especially when it's your, your, your friends, family, and coworkers, before you, as we like to say, snap, really try to understand why would this person feel and think like that? I know we touched on it briefly, being raised on love or survival. Uh, Those are the type of things that make people act the way they do sometimes. So, Mm -hmm. again, it's kind of like the baby cussing. Don't be so appalled at the baby cussing. Be mad at who the baby learned that from. Right. You know, so if I can close on anything is don't get mad at a baby that cuss. (laughs) 
Okay. <laughs> All right, but man. hey, man, uh, as we end here today, once again, uh, mm-hmm. it's always a joy to spend yeah. uh, spend some time with you and right. talk about the topics. Yeah. Want to shout out uh, Podcast Detroit for right. always having us and. Once again, yep. a thing of protection. Yep. Uh, and look us up. Thank you for everybody sitting in this uh, group I'm looking at uh, okay. for listening and um, uh, listening to what we had to say and to tell our stories and you know Absolutely. things like that. Yeah. And uh, we yeah. always welcome people. If somebody want to come and sit and talk with us, y'all more than welcome to come and have a seat at the table. I'm telling you, you'll love it. And just real quick, next week, uh, hopefully we, we got uh, some really good stuff we're going to be talking about. Uh, we got a guest that we're trying to get in the right. studio next week. So uh, if you just recently started watching us, like I said, check us out on the social media. Hit that like and button as well as the share button. But I most definitely look for some of our upcoming podcasts. We're only getting better at this, guys. We'll see you next week. All right.